The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. Left my glasses in there, please. Uh, the mayor does not have his glasses, so we're in more trouble than we normally are. Amen. Uh, first item is uh, approval of the official agenda, and we have uh, uh, are going to make some changes in regard to the order of the agenda this evening. That we have uh, uh, have two aldermen here tonight that uh, came from the Gulf Coast just to be here for the meeting. A portion of the meeting. A portion of the meeting will have to leave uh, as soon as uh, we have this. Is Mr. Cox? Uh, I don't He's on know. The phone. Huh? He's here. He's on the phone. Uh, okay. okay. First oh. thing is the uh, approval of the official agenda with some changes. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, board, for your consideration, uh, Alderman Davis and I uh, uh, hitched a ride, so to speak, from the Gulf Coast where we are on university business to attend a portion of the meeting. We will be doing that and then we will be getting up and leaving because we've got to get back. There's a meeting tonight that we are missing that we need to appear for a few minutes of. So we will be uh, leaving after a couple of items of business. But we have reviewed the agenda and would uh, present for your consideration a number of items for a consent agenda. Uh, first, the on page two, the public hearing on uh, both the TIF bond projects, A and B under Roman numeral eight, as well as the consideration of those projects, which are E and F on board business, we would like to move to the very front of the meeting before public appearances. Then for your consideration for a consent agenda, item A under Roman numeral nine, mayor's business, <laughs> Roman numeral 10, item D, as in dog. Uh, then, of course, as I said, E, F, and uh, as it's now numbered, I, uh, G and H having been stricken. Uh, and J uh, moved to the front of the meeting for the public hearing and uh, consideration of those particular items. Then in Roman numeral 11, airport business, all six items to consent agenda. Uh, in uh, Office of the City Clerk, item uh, two, Matt, is okay for consent. Uh, then uh, number E, electric department, adding, uh, this is consideration of the electric department agenda, uh, excuse me, electric department budget for the fiscal year next, their fiscal year starting in uh, July 1. We same. put that on the consent no, with sir. the, uh, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, oh, go ahead, let's do this. With the addition to that particular item of excluding employee raises, which will be considered at the time all other city employee raises are considered. So adding that to the motion and then moving the whole thing, the adoption of the basic budget to the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not uh, in favor of that. Um, are you also going to remove uh, from the budget the uh, increases in salaries for or pay for the meter readers and the um, and the right of way crew? Uh, uh, of course, Alderman Perkins. I, I'm just asking a question. Uh, I mean, yes, and I'm, I'm not arguing. I, I don't really consider those two items to actually be part of the electric department budget. It's in there, though. Uh, well, it's in there other than money might have been allocated but doesn't have to be expended for those items. I really think they should stand alone. I, I, I don't consider those two items part of the budget, but I'm uh, uh, open to doing whatever anyone wants to do on that, of course. Now, if we can remove it, I can, I'll vote for the budget. The salaries are out right now. We can remove the right-of-way crew and the, um, and, the, um, and the meter readers, then I'll, I'll put on the consent agenda. Oh. Uh, does any of the do any of the other members of the board have any any thoughts on this? We can remove it completely from consent. Uh, they want to remove it completely, so we scratch that from consent. 
uh, fire department item G, all four items for consent, one, two, three, four. The personnel office, all four items for consent. Public services items two and three, uh, three should be uh, renumbered. There's a one, two, and two, so it should be one, two, and three. So we're talking two and three on consent. And so I would offer those changes to the agenda for your consideration. Mr. Chairman, if we could just remove uh, number D under 10. I don't have any public comments on it, but I would just want to be recorded voting no on item D under 10. So uh, uh, we don't have to have any explanation. I just want to be recorded voting no. Uh, 10D. Uh, okay, so we, uh, in a sense, will, uh, in effect, will remove that from consent agenda. Yes, sir. This is board business 10D, as in dog. Does anyone else have any changes they would like to make? With those changes, do I hear, uh, and that was a point of motion, I believe. Uh, yes. A second to uh, the motion in regard to the approval of the agenda. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor of the changes and the current uh, uh, official agenda say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. I'm just kidding. Sorry. I had already voted on. <laughs> Just following along with you, Dan, tonight. Uh, little joke? Yeah. Okay, whatever. Okay, uh, approval of the Minutes City Starville Board of Alderman, regular meeting of May 6th. Do we have a motion for approval? Mayor and Board move approval of May 6th, 2008 minutes. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Obviously it carries. Uh, comments by the mayor and the board of aldermen. Are there any comments from any of the aldermen tonight? The mayor will hold his comments later. Uh, before we get into, we'll come back to the citizen comments that we would like to go ahead and say, uh, open up the uh, the public hearings for the, uh, the two issues we have tonight. One is a public hearing on a uh, resolution by the Mayor and Board of Aldermen for adopting and approving an authorized city to make uh, reimbursements from bonds issued for the tax incentive financing improvements for the Cotton Mill Marketplace project. We will take them first. And uh, Lucian, are you here somewhere around out there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, once you get on the hot seat. And again tonight that uh, Brooks, you're going to give just, uh, you and uh, Mark are going to just give a, a kind of a, you're giving this thing about three times in here already. So if we could just have just a, uh, a quick synopsis of what we're doing here so there's a lot of people here tonight that have not been here previously and then we would open up a public comment after your presentation. We have some significant updates too. I think there'll be time we to get this through. Um, since we last visited, we've uh, continued to, to work uh, diligently in terms of moving the, the project forward. As we mentioned uh, during the last uh, Board of Alderman, uh, meeting before this body, uh, we have attended the International Council Shopping Center Convention in Las Vegas called Recon, uh, where we brought the, pro the project to the public retailers uh, and had a very good response from a number of retailers, including department stores, uh, which we had discussions with the two national retailers for this location here, uh, as well as discussions with retailers for this kind of position here. Despite, uh, despite the overall concern of, in the retail market, uh, we had a very good convention, uh, both from the retailers uh, as well as uh, other uh, potential uh, uh, developers that, that had strong interest in coming in and working with us in the development of the hotel and or management of the conference center in, in a, venture, uh, a venture structure that we haven't really defined yet. Uh, one of the other big significant things we accomplished during that same period is we retained uh, the nationally recognized retail consulting firm Chapman & Associates, 
which has been doing a detailed study of the Starkville market and defining what our trade area and our trade area potential is. And that is, the results have been good, uh, despite, there again, the national retail environment. That study should hopefully be completed by the end of the month. We still have some issues that we want to define, but it's shown strong, a strong need for uh, particularly restaurants and entertainment, as well as retail that's not representative, that does not have representative locations in the Columbus Starkville market at this time. Uh, probably the most exciting thing, though, and this, this goes to the commitment that this body, uh, we've requested this body <coughs> in the city, and in our, uh, in our work with the university, we have an executed memora memorandum of understanding with the university, uh, which outlines uh, our agreement to consummate our transaction with the city. But more importantly, we are now structuring our agreement with the university to purchase 10 acres of land, which means more importantly to the city and to the county that the 10 acres of land that's here will be actually being going on to the tax roll, tax rolls as as property owned by Cotton Mill Marketplace. Heretofore, it's never been taxed because it's university property. In addition to the capital improvements that we'll be making to the property. Lastly, and probably I think most important, and Lucian was represented, and Butler Snow represented us in this portion. We were uh, induced by the Mississippi Business Finance Corporation in the amount of $120 million for goes on bond financing. It has not been approved by the governor yet. We're working towards that end. Uh, but we do have a, and I think this speaks to the strength of the development and what we're committed to as developers and our capacity. We do have one of our lead banks as a, uh, a letter of credit commitment it's not obligatory, but it's a letter of credit commitment towards those bonds issue, being issued. And that's a huge step towards the development of this project. Uh, Timing-wise, we uh, are continuing to move forward aggressively. Uh, Pritchard Engineers uh, is down literally to the point of a grading plan. Uh, we're working with trying to uh, finalize tenant leases and defining some other development issues that we have to do. With your all support and vote this evening, it'll keep us on target to hopefully release for construction drawings in the next 60 okay. days and start construction in May of <coughs> Complete the center by October of 2010. Uh, it's just been remarkable how fast this has occurred, and it's really by your all support and help that we've accomplished this much. Are there questions from the general public? Yes. Um, my first team is in particular this plan, and you mentioned a historic district uh, being nearby, but it never has addressed the fact that you have a movie theater and a parking complex where you are a homeowner, and that has not been mentioned in the paper or at this meeting. Uh, what approach has been done to the homeowner before acquiring that property? Our plan, our plan is to begin working on that once we got both the, the TIF financing done as well as our financing organized with our banks, which we're in the process of doing. And then we, you know, we will begin approaching the owners of the homes and those that are interested in selling, we certainly will be interested in buying those properties at a fair market value. But if all don't sell, it's the plan. The plans can be offered accordingly. Other questions from the general public? I have a question. I would like to know, um, as a um, direct citizen, I would just like to know, is there any other place to consider besides going over to the Cotton Mill? Any pl other place here in Starkville? Really, why why did we come to the conclusion of that? Yes, ma'am. The And that's a very good question. How we identified the property was this this land was originally uh, a, a developed as a, a redevelopment district and, and a HUD redevelopment area, and it was it was underutilized by the, and owned partially by the university. When we first came to town and identified the potential need of the project, we actually met with the university and with with one of the owners, which was Ergon, and identified what the need of the university as well as the city. And the conference center was one of the most important items that came up. 
also a need for university or student related housing was a second large need. We also felt, found as we did our research that retail and convenient retail to the university and to an, an improvement of this piece of property was a key need identified both by the university and the city because it's at the main interest to the university. It's been underdeveloped for a number of years. Prior to Mark and I purchasing this property, they'd been vacated and empty for a number of years and didn't really present a good image to the university or the city. So we felt like that it was an ideal location. It actually took an under, a underdeveloped piece of property and invested about $175 million in new, in new improvements on the property and would aid the community in redeveloping and revitalizing this area towards downtown. And it really also was driven by the retailers' choice of location. And my other problem, my other problem was, like Mr. Williams said, you know, we had a uh, people that's been over in that area for a long time. We could bring on the volume of parking for them getting to their houses. And, you know, I just wanted to know if they were considered at that time also. And y'all just had to laugh. So you can answer that question. Yes, would you state your name, please, ma'am, for the record? My name is Dorothy Isaac. Okay, and would you? Okay. Uh, anyone else that would like to speak and ask questions? Yes. I'm Stephanie Stitch. Uh, I have, actually I have two things. One is I have a letter from uh, Chris Campany. Mr. Campany is a certified planner and a resident of Starkville, but he had to take his mother to an appointment and I asked that I drop this letter off for your review, so I'll do that before I leave. Um, also, uh, I have a summary here of, as, as many of you know, um, transportation policy is my area of study. And so here I have a summary of uh, transit and university city systems um, for the SEC so we can see how Starkville and Mississippi State compare. But as related to this, first I would like to commend the city and this body for looking at creative financing like TIF. Um, I think it's a unique tool that's great for uh, redevelopment for wide areas of our town. And I appreciate the uh, courage that it takes to come forward with something like TIF, which is difficult to understand initially, particularly the first time it comes through. Some of the things that I would like to ask you to, to know uh, with this development and with um, Louisville 12 Marketplace is that neither of them are particularly transit oriented developments. Parking is, is to the front and to the side. It doesn't. It's not well designed for pedestrian or bicycle friendly routes. In particular, with this development, because you're connecting the university to the town and to the cotton district, more emphasis is, is we're using public investment in this area. More emphasis needs to be placed on the walkability and the bikeability of this between the two locations. Um, as you know, transit oriented development. That's just Thank you. Would you like to answer that? I think we've had discussions uh, in the mayor's office about that. Yeah, let, me, let me try to address this because that was one of the key issues that both the mayor and our architects and our planners addressed, as well as the request of the university. If you look at the two parking decks here, as well as our, our recommendation, as well as Neil Schaefer, was to boulevard and make Russell Street a major walkability corridor into the university. We're actually staging these two parking decks in substantial volume to 
to actually be public access parking decks in order to make the development walkable to take to add additional parking capacity for major event parking for the university. We have staged and shown an additional crossover walk walk bridge here on across Highway 12 now. <laughs> There's our discussion with Neil Schaefer and as well as recommendation from, from the mayor and staff is to try to improve the walkability connection between Cotton Mills and, and, and the Cotton District so that we enhance walkability across. The university has also asked us to, to stage uh, uh, locations here for the, the university transit uh, systems to be able to bring the buses on onto this facility to drop students and guests here on on the uh, the center and off the center as well. Right now, we have these scheduled for about 1,500 parking spaces. We're going to redesign those uh, to to come up to about 3,000 parking spaces, which is substantially above code, and probably add for sale or for lease condominiums on top of that. So I think that we're working very hard to address both walkability and livability because we have residential units in this, in this development as well. So I think that we're trying to address some of those concerns. So bear with us, I think we'll, we'll get there. Other questions? I have one more. Did you do any surveys in that area? Or not do any surveys of the people when you say surveys, you're talking about uh, coming and talk, uh, verbal surveys? Yeah, just surveys. Any surveys? Questionnaires or whatever. Uh, questionnaires. No, we did not. No. Yes, because the only thing that represents that is the approach to the We don't know. I'm that alderman and I am not. Can you say the address again? What are the uh, There, there will be, uh, these will probably be a configuration of apartments, and we have our architects now work, looking, looking at the top floor <coughs> of these two facilities to add four cell condominium units on top of these buildings. We saw a design at, our, at one of our conventions that we liked that was particularly interesting <coughs> to put condom, four cell condominiums on top of these structures. The VISTA, the way we had our architects design this was to try to leave the land and the topography as it is and not make it one big flat structure. There again, respecting the, 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 the historical nature of the building because the design here is to leave the Cooley building as a national historic landmark in place and utilize that as a conference center, which we think is very, very important to the development and to the history of the university. It will remain at grade level. There's 45 feet difference in, in the grade level here as opposed to the location here. So the Cooley building will actually stand at its present location and height. So the vista across here, you all, will be absolutely remarkable. Why do you feel there needs to be more housing at that point? It goes to an, an earlier comment that this becomes walkable, this becomes connected to the university, and this really becomes uh, the an attractive feature and an open and a front door to the university. This is the trend that's happening in every university town in the southeast. It is that there's high demand in close proximity to the university, particularly by alumni and, and, and retirees that want to be close to the university campus. They bring a lot of money into the, this economy. Well, I noticed on South Montgomery, we've got condominiums there that are waiting, so we've been looking at for quite a while. Uh, has any We are in active negotiations. So we don't have anything like um, legally down that says that they we, will. We couldn't do say if we did. did. We couldn't say if we did. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? This is mostly. Would you say who you are for the record, please? I'm Dr. Harry Cole. I'm Free. My comments are mostly directed to the board. You're here. I'm afraid that once you sit down, will be closed and no one will speak. The tip line issue to me appears to be public subsidy private enterprise. 
we have heard an awful lot of hype recently about how this is going to be free. Free because there's no such thing as free. The hype that we've been getting, and it has been hype, is this will be at no cost to start the residents. Yes, it will be at cost. Every person who spends money on that in that uh, for goods or services there will be paying the taxes and the sales tax and property tax, which will in turn be paying the state. Several other things. We have heard or have been told that the cost of the infrastructure can be eight and a half million dollars. Is that real? Is that an actual cost? How much are we going to ask to borrow? Eight and a half million dollars? I think it's premature to do any TIF bond application at this point. We ought to wait until we see if this project is viable, see if they actually do get the stores they're going to say, so we'll come up with a cost of what the actual infrastructure ought to be. I'm glad you mentioned the uh, boulevard of Russell Street. That is an extravagance. You really don't need it. Uh, it's not going to improve traffic flow. Uh, there have been efforts to, by certain people to have this boulevard for years. But why? That just adds to the cost. What does it matter? What matters is the higher the cost, the longer it's going to take to pay back by whatever the TIF revenue is. The, this project, and I'm, I'm all for it, private speculation and private development. I have no problem with your efforts. What I have a problem with is committing our city to a large, could be a very risky investment in this. Eight and a half million dollars. Is it eight and a half? If it were in fact eight and a half million dollars, depending on the duration of the loan and the interest rate, that eight and a half million dollars could easily become 13 million dollars uh, based on the interest based on the interest rate and the time. So it's not just eight and a half or whatever it is, it's the time value of that money that has to be considered as well. Um, I've done a little study that shows that sales tax won't come close to paying that back. Not at all. It's got to be property taxes. Is there is the board going to commission an independent audit of property tax potential for this area? Or are we going to believe just simply someone who's trying to sell something. Uh, I want to get back to the issue I had on my notes here about the private homes that are going to be impacted. Sure, you're going to approach the ones who will sell if they want to sell. Well, they don't want to sell. Some of them have probably been on those homes for a long time. I'm sure that Starkville, and being a longtime resident of Starkville, I like to see us get published. Kind of publicity I don't want to see is us being on national news as being the second community in the nation who has used eminent domain to grab uh, homes for private development. And I'm going to say that word because I, you probably didn't want to say it, but that, uh, that's totally inappropriate in the city. Question was what specific stores are you just speculating? There was a proposed mega mall over close to Columbus. It hasn't gone in yet. Why? Is it because of the state of the current economy? There, it just isn't the time for that. What makes you think your project is going to succeed when others have failed? We have had three different entities come before this board and make presentations on elaborate condominium complexes on the same basis and the same justification that you're making that these right across from the university, you know, I'm not going to spend mega bucks to buy, it hasn't happened. And I think you're benefiting from part of that by you're getting some of the land that Aragon bought for such a development and it never materialized. I'll bet they're, they're just tickled to death if you want to buy it, take off their hands. Um, what about stores that go into this market? What are they going to do to the stores already in the community? For example, are you looking at Sears? Are you looking at Pennies? Either one of those, if the Pennies goes in that mall, what's going to happen to the Pennies over on the west side of town? It's going to be a zero-sum game. We're not gaining anything. What happens if Sears happens to be one? 
is that going to put the local Sears franchise company business out of business? So that's probably going to lose his business. How about the, you had in the paper was described some complexes. What's that going to do for the sun that's out on uh, the west side of town also? When they opened, it resulted in the closing of the cinema that's now on this piece of property. So how big, uh, what can this town tolerate as well as far as uh, different levels of service such as in cinemas and, and the like? You talk about student housing. Three years ago, we had a comprehensive plan developed by Shelley Johnston. At the time, there was an 18% vacancy rate in rental property in town. I doubt very seriously that that's changed much. We have a certain uh, rental property. Are students going to be able to afford that kind of property? I, I teach engineering. I don't think any engineering students will be able to afford it. Unless, I, I, I don't see any of them encumbered in speaking about having silver spoons in their mouth. Um, is it really a reasonable expectation to have student housing in a project like this? You know, I'm, I'm leaving that as a rhetorical question. What happens if the project fails? What happens if there's not enough sales tax generated or a combination of sales tax and property tax generated to repay the loan? What is the city's obligation in that case? Who is liable? if that loan cannot be repaid. Is it the city? Is it the developer? Like I say, I don't have any problem with you people borrowing as much money as you want, building what you want, but I don't want to see our city borrow a lot of money for one project when we can't even afford to pay streets, rebuild sewers, and other critical infrastructure. Mr. Needs. Cole, you've asked them a lot of questions. Could you give them time to respond let me, to let it? Let me finish, please. And I, This is supposed to be a public hearing. I don't think it's really a public hearing. It is. Maybe I need to put a time hearing. limit. Oh, no. Oh, where's the written as a time limit? No, we won't get into that. Uh, what's with the city's obligation on this conference center? Are we going to have to, or are we going to have any debt associated or encumbrance associated with it? We'd like to see some of that. Do we really need that expensive conference center? The invisible air service that we have Lucian, would you like to address the one about the, uh, the issuing of the bonds and what they're based on? Yes, for Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, specifically, Lucian, in terms of what happens sure. if there's not enough money? Uh, actually, the contemplation is not. This is a public hearing on whether the city is to move forward with uh, passing a financial plan. There are no bonds being passed for tonight. Uh, at some point in the future, once the final call is quote public infrastructure, uh, the boulevarding of uh, Russell Street, and you heard Mr. Holt from the state, they're working with an engineering firm to 
with those traffic stops. What's the traffic going to do is it's in a race book. It's, uh, it's over. Uh, this thing is all built. Uh, it's contemplated that the uh, taxation of financial department would not be issued by the city until the project is completed, up and running, and some few months after that. To see that there will be retail sales tax. To see that there will be increased that law. So bonds are not going to be issued until that project is up and running and for some period of time after it's built and actually in service. Okay. Uh, additionally, if the bonds are issued uh, under this TIF uh, plan, what is considered is that only 75% of the sales tax being generated with this revenue at uh, this center would be considered new. So 25% of it mm -hmm. is contemplated already exists in the property market. So that you're not taking 100 percent of what would be generated at this facility. That's the sales tax. That's the sales tax. The city gets 1.3 cents in the dollar sales tax. They get 18 and a half percent or 7 percent. That's right. Uh, 1.3 cents. That's right. That's right. If this, if, if a loan for 8.5 million dollars, <coughs> 10 years, 4.5 percent, that's 10.7 million dollars. It would take over those ten years, this thing, over a million dollars, we pay that. We pay that with over a million dollars. At 1.3 percent of the revenue tax, the revenue would have to be 82 million dollars generating a sales tax. And I realize it's not all sales tax, it's property tax. That's right. what. But who's going to audit the potential for property tax? Well, of course, once it gets on the tax roll. That's, I mean, it's there, it's obvious, it's a theft. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and not only included in the tax is the real property, as additional okay. personal so property. That's, that's, those taxes, that more tax is the sale tax, don't need. And that's, need that's county. Well, if if it doesn't meet, you won't issue eight and a half million dollars with a bond. I mean, it's pure and simple. It, it, it's got to be made also when the bonds are issued. you got to have 120% revenue to support whatever debt they are Well, I was only using the eight and a half million. That's the number that we have been Yeah, well, I mean, that's not to exceed number. It's only based on what actually is generated. Mm -hmm. If that number is five million, it's five million. If it's eight million, it's eight million. Well, that's fine. I, I think it would be very short this time. Oh, no, so I mean, you know, we're not going to do it until we know those are, uh, uh, this is not going to be requested to the bonds until the project is built up and running and you have to hit it. Both on sales tax and on oil tax. So and the number will be whatever it is. So what we've done with the preliminary number is not to see eight and a half million. It may be short of that. Time will tell. But what, when, how is that eight and a half million generated? A percentage of what it costs? No, well, eight and a half is based on what what the preliminary number shows it can be, not to see. We don't know what that's going to be until it's built. You know, it may be uh, some other number. We want to see eight and a half million. Now, the other thing is, once the bonds are issued, if you buy one of those bonds, you're buying them at risk. The only thing that's pledged is that increased tax revenue. If it's not there, you as a bondholder are taking a risk. They typically are going to have a little higher interest rate on that statement. Uh, and that's another reason for when you issue the bonds. If the revenue coming in, it's 120% of whatever the bond is. You've got a 20% surplus. Well, I want to make it clear that this infrastructure cost we're talking about, the city does not pay that much money. No, they do not. No. They do not. Yeah. They, they will enter at some point in time, subsequent to the board takes action tonight to approve this tip loan. At some point in time, once the hard costs are identified by the engineer, the infrastructure. The city will uh, be asked to enter into a development reimbursement agreement with the developers to reimburse them for their costs. But only after they've known what those costs are and what public infrastructure is going to be paid for. So the Russell Street, <coughs> whether it's the walkway going across uh, uh, Highway 12 to the campus, uh, or any other thing that's going to be of a public nature. So it's to our advantage not to make that infrastructure extravagant. Such a well, it depends, what, it depends on what the, the study shows is me. Uh, I mean, you've heard a you've heard a member of the public talk tonight about the need for pedestrians and bikeways and all that stuff. Is that extravagant? No, I don't think so. Because and there's one, one other issue in the that uh, <coughs> Boulevard and the street that we not mentioned that whose property is going to be taken to do that? It's going to require widening right away. Well, they're donating the property. Pardon? Well, donate. No, no, no. You're going to take property on the north side of the street? I, 
I just said we would donate the property. You got to have it first. What we, property are you talking about? We'll, we are purchasing the property on the, on the south side of the road, the pool property. We are purchasing. So you're all all of the line. You do a we floor. Would, we all would the donate line will do the property. No, you're not answering my question. Yes, all, I am. No, you're, no, you're not. You're saying that all the line will be on the south side. I of the said road. I said that we would instruct Neil Shaker that we would donate any necessary widening property. I don't know how, how clear I can make it. Well, you got required before you can donate. Now, I'm sure you don't <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how well, clear I, mean, I can say it. Yeah. If I buy the property, I can donate it to, to the okay. MDOT to, to widen the property. I don't think that Neil Schaefer is going to recommend that it's widened, according to my conference call today. But if, they, if it needs widening, we will donate after we acquire. Now going back to eminent domain, there is no contemplation of using eminent domain in court to start or did it. It would be more than the second city in this country to do that. So they've done all over the country. And I agree with you, it shouldn't be done. But there for urban renewal is critical to cities to renew their areas to create increases in taxes and what they've done. There's no eminent domain contemplated by any of this property. And we will not request it. That particular area was part of the urban renewal area. That's correct. That's correct. And 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 I and Mark and I will publicly state in this body that we will not request it. So for stuff that is going to be public, it's still not going to be taken by any of them. So the willing property owner wants to sell their property, they'll be able to do it. If they don't, they won't be able to do it. Do we have any other questions? Now, I'd like to address, because I think the, there, there is an attempt at, at, at painting a, a brush of, of intent on our development and our methodology that's, that's incorrect, and I don't want anybody in this room to leave with that impression. And I think it's really important. You know, we, we came to this city without any knowledge of anybody's ownership interest in any piece of property or, or area of property. We selected this site simply because it's the best retail site that we could find in the city. No, no agendas. So, you know, that's first and foremost. You know, it was selected simply because it's the largest piece of undeveloped real estate I've seen in my career in front of the Southeast Conference University anyway. And I think it just, it lends itself to, to redevelopment. I think another very significant part of this is right now with the university's ownership and with the <coughs> underdevelopment of this property, I think the total abalorum tax paid on this piece of property is less than, than $5,000 a year. It, the city is not making any, any abalorum tax in the county, almost zero. Our net investment and in, in improvements <coughs> on this hard cost investment our risk is $155 million. And, and, and we're doing this because we believe in, in the city, we believe in the university. Mark's educated all his children here, and we think it's going to be a great asset for the quality of life in this community. Our bankers will not finance this project if they don't believe in the feasibility of every component. <coughs> Not $155 million. Our bankers would have not issued a $122 million commitment on a financial, on a, on a letter of credit if they thought that we were not prudent. So we're very cautious to guidance. And we want to be very, we want to be very forthright with this body, with this community, and with the university. So being that way, we hired what we think is probably one of the preeminent investment banker advisors and also advise major universities to make sure that the developer is right and not selling himself or the university to come in here and do his work. That's, and that's Charlie McDonald sitting right here. He just flew in here today. He's done his work for the University of Central Florida. He's done his work for the University of Kentucky. And his job is to simply tell us if we're right or wrong and advise in a arm's length capacity. We don't want to 
to trick anyone. And we don't want to trick ourselves. You know, Mark and I got $20 million in spend. Why do we want to mislead anybody up here? Why would we have any agenda other than to try to do what's right? I went to school here. I have three sons still graduated. The other one's here. I love Mississippi State. to go uh, elsewhere to shop. And we're trying to create and transform the city of Starkville to where this development becomes what it, what, it, what it needs to be and what it always is, is that Mississippi State and Starkville is the, is the heartbeat of this whole region. And it desperately needs a development like this. When we met with the, the university, we didn't go out there with an agenda or anything else. We went out and said, what can we do? We see this as potential. And the university administration, not, not the developers, said, what is the most important thing? They did the same thing with the administration. What does this community need to move itself in the next direction? A conference center that's competitive, but not, not, over, not, not in excess. A, a full service hotel that can house Southeast Conference sports teams, because right now, that tax and those teams go to Columbus, or they go to Tuscaloosa, or they go to Meridian. The university administration said, the front door of our university is the worst looking front door of any university in the Southeast Conference, and it's embarrassing. And we said, we have an idea how to change it. And we're willing to put our money at risk to do that. And they said, we see that as creating enormous value for our community and our university because it's going to help us to attract a better student, a better athlete, a better professor, a better staff member. And that's our agenda. Now, if this community doesn't want that, then, then that's the decision that we've made in this, 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 this hall of state. That's I have a question over here. I, I have a, a question to come in too. I've been here 49 years here in Starkville, Mississippi, and I also have the walk to Rome to get to the Starkville Mall. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to walk to the Mall. Yeah. And I have to walk to the Mall. And I have to walk to the Mall. And I have to walk to the Mall. We have another side of town that's undeveloped. Nobody's looking over that part coming from Ward 6 and 7. We're not looking at that. We're only looking at the university. I love the university. I went to Mississippi State. And I also love it, you know, love the land and stuff out there. But what we're talking about is quality home homes that have been here all their life. What we're looking for <coughs> is personal development over to that side of town. That's what we're looking for. Everything, everything has to go to the university. Five years, these kids are out of here. We love them, but five years, they're out of here. I've lived in this community all my life, so that's what I want to see. Some progress with the other side of town. We'd like to do that too. Where this is our first, first, first attempt. Please. Are there any other questions from the public? Yes. Uh, Would you Duncan. identify who you are, please? Uh, I have a question about the, the improvements on Russell Street. Will that continue the entire length of Russell Street, or is that just for the portion of your property development? It's to be determined. But I think that the most the, on our conference call. Today, I think the, the biggest extent would be just to bring people into the main entrance of the shopping center. From my perspective, I would like to see that entire area <coughs> rework so that it's more pedestrian friendly because we do, we live off Green Square Street. We like to walk there and we would like to have the opportunity and the ability to walk to the, to the development that exists, which I, I personally before I think it's a, a great idea for the area. Uh, 
Thank you. Anyone else that would like to make a comment? Yes. I wonder if all of them have considered the increase, the potential increased cost in fire protection and law enforcement protection as a result of the consequence of this project. Also, has anybody bothered to take a look at what drainage problems, if any, might exist downstream from this project? Uh, as Holland Davis might recall, uh, many, many, many times one of his constituents has pointed out the drainage problems that happened with her property in Reno as a consequence of the development uh, out in that area. So, fire protection, uh, police protection, drainage, involving infrastructure, and finally, since this is going to be essentially public money converted for this project, is there any bid factors, are there any bid factors that come into play in your infrastructure fund? Or is this uh, completely outside the normal bid processes that the city would have to undertake if it were to construct this infrastructure? Well, maybe I can't wait. The uh, state law does not require that you bid. Uh, the developers can do it. The city has to look at the cost associated with it and then the development reimbursement agreement. The city will be looking at those costs. The state law allows the developer to build it and then dedicate that infrastructure to the city. What if the city doesn't like the, uh, the cost that has been generated by the... Those things will be negotiated in this development reimbursement agreement that will be approved by this board. Once it's identified what those costs are, so the city will have the opportunity to do that agreement to reach an agreement with the developer on those costs. The state law does not require that we do that. Uh, Spencer, do you want to say something? I have something I'd like to say. Anyone else that have a question for these gentlemen? Mr. Mr. Mayor, one thing before we get too far past Dr. Williams' comments about storm water. One thing that is different between now and, and when that shopping center was built behind is, is that we have in this term passed storm water runoff ordinances and new increased uh, engineering requirements on the front end of any development, not just this type of development. And it's to hopefully 
alleviate those very concerns that we're still dealing with over there, and you're 100% accurate about that. So. Clyde, we had public hearings in regard to that and was passed in this administration that you cannot, uh, uh, I think we have zero tolerance. Is that right, Ed? So we've got, that's one of the little tiny ditty do's that we've done in this administration. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, my name is Abbott Turner. Um, I'm looking at the drawing, but uh, a lot of people have time with direct. How would you get to the without getting on one way street or anything like that? So people don't like to get we, We've hired that. Uh, Shapers to try to help design the plan for road improvements there. It's not completed yet. It should be completed by mid uh, mid June, and we'll bring the plan back for the group as it's further refined. We want the development to be absolutely friendly to the, to the community. Uh, they they feel like that uh, by then they're going to have a lot of those type of concerns and questions answered. They are actually going to. Citizens raised of how far and to what extent they want to recommend as a plan to carry the traffic volume through 2030, not through 2010, when the center will be completed. They're going to actually design an improvement plan that will show what would need to be done through 2030 to alleviate congestion in and around Russell and Spring around the entire development. So we don't plan for the short term; we actually plan for the long term. Bring it. Bring it the roads will basically operate the same way. Uh, but we'll Mr. Get Turner's a, road, a road map that will show in more detail exactly how the roads will work on around June 15th. Mr. Turner's right. question is more basic than we're talking about. Explain to him how someone would get to this area by the highway, by Russell Street, and so forth. That's really what he's talking about. Where okay. is it located and how oh, you okay. going to get there? Uh, it's, the, lo it's located on the, the corner of Highway 12 and Spring, Spring Street and Black Jack Road right here. The Hampton Inn's right here. The old Burger King's right here. The old Burger Creek thing looks like a lot. Okay, I know where that is. And that's right. It, that's the old Burger King's that's right there. And this is the old Cooley building. Physical plant. No, physical plant. Physical plant. Cotton physical plant. Cotton big, cotton. big, big con uh, Brick building and the comfort is right here. And Russell Street comes all the way and goes into downtown right here. You familiar with Russell Street? Tell me. Tell me. Hey, you know where the old Clay movie theater is? <laughs> yeah, the old movie theater. Well, you, you remember where the, the old Burger King is? Remember where the Burger King is? That, that's it right there. That's part. That's the anchor site or anchor corner of this development. Mississippi State sits right there. Football stadium's right here. <clears throat> All right. Are there any other questions? Yes. I'm David Thornell. Uh, I've gotten to know this market over the past seven plus years. This is a perfect time for these types of developments. The city has an opportunity for two developments tonight to both move forward with TIP uh, financing. Uh, TIF is the, uh, economic. the very best way to partner with developers because it does require the developers to go ahead and do what they say they're going to do. Uh, I've gotten to know both sets of the developers uh, over the past year plus, and I know them to be honorable, to be smart, uh, to be uh, capable of doing this in the right way. And I think that the city is going to be uh, much better off. It's going to be 110% successful. I look forward to both of these things coming out of the ground. It is something that's needed and wanted. It's something that is um, suited for this community, uh, probably more so than any other types of development <coughs> right now, just because of the need and wants of the community. Uh, it is allowing this project uh, because of zoning and the uh, ability to improve an area that's really blighted right now, but you see the empty stores in front, that uh, you'll have a better community for the adjoining <coughs> residents because of the entertainment Shopping that they'll have available to them next door. Uh, so I see no downside to this, and I'm just uh, in uh, each of these folks for being here and choosing to talk. Anyone else? Your last chance. Anyone else? 
that I bring these public hearings on the uh, cotton mill uh, facility uh, to conclusion. The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. Notice of the hearing tonight was properly done, published, so forth. Uh, you are giving us your assurance of that. Okay. Thank you very much. And of course, a proof of publication will be forthcoming and so forth. Uh, with that assurance, then, I would offer for consideration the following resolution, uh, Mr. Mayor, which I intend to read. Good. A resolution approving the adoption and implementation of the tax increment financing plan. Cotton Mill Marketplace Project, Starkville, Mississippi, June 2008. Tax increment financing plan. Not issuance of bonds, not issuance of anything. Approval of the plan. Whereas, under the power and authority granted by the laws of the state of Mississippi, and particularly under Chapter 45 of Title 21, Mississippi Code of 1972, as amended, the governing body on Tuesday, May the 20th, what is today's day? 17th. The 17th. We will make that change. Uh, June 17, right. June 17, 2008 did adopt a certain resolution entitled Res Resolution of the Mayor and Aldermen of the City of Starkville, Mississippi determining the necessity for and invoking the authority granted to municipalities and counties by the legislature with respect to tax increment financing as set forth in Chapter 45 of Title 21, Mississippi Code of 1972 is amended, determining that the Cotton Mill Marketplace Project is a project eligible for tax increment financing under the laws of the state that a public hearing be conducted in connection with the tax increment financing plan and for related purposes. Whereas, as directed by the aforesaid resolution and as required by law, a notice of public hearing was published one time in the Starkville Daily News, a newspaper having general circulation within the city, and was so published in said newspaper on Friday, May 30, 2008, as evidenced by the publisher's proof of publication of the same heretofore presented to the governing body and filed with the clerk. And whereas the notice of public hearing generally described the TIF, Tax Increment Financing Plan, and further called for a public hearing to be held in the court, City Hall Courtroom, 101 Lampkin Street, Starkville, Mississippi, at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, June the 17th, 2008, in order for the general public to stay to present their views on the TIF plan. And whereas at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, June 17, 2008, the public hearing was held and all in attendance were given an opportunity to stay to present their oral and or written comments on the TIF plan. Now therefore, be it re uh, resolved by the governing authority of the city of Starkville as follows. Section 1, that all the findings of fact made and set forth in the preamble to this resolution shall be in the same or hereby found, found, declared, and adjudicated to be truth and true and correct. That's talking about the notice of the public hearing. Section 2, that the governing body of the city of Starkville is now fully authorized and empowered under the provisions of Chapter 45 of Title 21, Mississippi Code of 1972, as amended, to adopt and implement the TIF plan, and does hereby adopt and approve such plan as presented in order to assist in the construction and development of the proposed project, and whereby the City of Starkville, acting on behalf of itself and the county, Octavia Hill County, will issue one or more series of tax increment financing revenue bonds or notes for the project in an amount not to exceed uh, $8,500,000, secured solely by a pledge by the city of up to 95% of the increased ad valorem taxes and up to 95% of retail sales tax rebates of the city and up to 95% of the ad valorem tax increase on real and personal property by Octavia Hall County. 
generated by construction and development in the TIF district as set forth in an interlocal agreement between the city and the county. Uh, which funds will be used to pay the cost of constructing a conference meeting center, public parking facilities, and various public infrastructure improvements in connection with the TIF plan. Uh, that the tax section three, that the tax increment financing bonds and notes of the city and county shall be issued pursuant to further, further proceedings of the governing bodies of the city of Starville. Step two or three, depending on how you're counting, with at least two more major steps yet to occur. So, Mr. Mayor, I would move the adoption of that resolution. Do we have a second? Second. Motion with a second. We will now have a roll call vote. Mr. McLaurin? Yay. Mr. Corey? Yay. Mr. Lincoln? Yay. Mr. Cox? Yay. Mr. Perkins? Nay. Ms. Self? Yay. Mr. Davis. Yay. It passes uh, by a vote of six to one. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll now do our second TIF bond. Middleton Marketplace Tax Incentive Financing Plan. Chris, you're here. Yes, sir. Are your other folks here? Yes, sir. We're going to hold that plan for y'all. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Chris Gurris with Gurris and Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Mark Castleberry, the owner of Startable 12 LLC. Uh, developer of the project on behalf of Jason Perry and Sean Kane, the principals with Luco Properties, also developer uh, of the project. And we have with us tonight uh, architect Tommy Stewart to uh, present a site plan and an overview of the project, which I'll let him do as soon as he is ready. Uh, the board is here tonight for a public hearing on the tax increment financing plan for Middleton Marketplace which will authorize up to $2.1 million in TIF bonds to pay for infrastructure improvements to serve the development and redevelopment of the State Street Shopping Center and the old Coke plant property along Highway 12. Uh, with that said, I'll let Mr. Stewart give an overview of the project, and then I will give some specifics related to the tax increment financing plan uh, regarding the economic <laughs> impact, the tax revenues, uh, and the particulars that are before the board tonight. Good evening. I'll try to make this as quick and painless as we can. Um, just to orient everybody to the plan. This is, out, this is Highway 12, and this is 25 <coughs> or Louisville Street. And this is the Elm State Shopping Center, and this is what used to be the Coke plant, which now is in the mall. But that gets you oriented to the site. And uh, we will. Before I show you some slides, I'll show you on the site plan. Sorry, that's the blue lights. Um, just to walk you through the project really quickly to orient you. This is this portion of the property. Could is someone flip the light switches on right there where yeah, the public can have a better view? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, All right, this is the piece of property that uh, is one of the code plants here is orient you again. State Shopping Center, Statewide Federal Credit Union is here. Citizens. And uh, Bruce is here on the corner. So that's kind of orient you. The project's divided up. Uh, there's two parcels here. There will be restaurants um, and a uh, four story hotel at the back, renovations to the shopping center and parking lots and roads and such. I'm just going to take you quickly through um, a computer model of the design. Uh, the hotel and restaurants are not. Uh, are masked in this model, but you get an idea. Um, let's go through this quickly. This will take you, uh, this is Highway 12. You look, you're, you'll be traveling 
east and uh, a new entrance to the facility via uh, at the shopping center we're going to be coming in right along this boulevard and heading into the shopping center the boulevard and entrance uh, as you can see it's a vastly different look than what's there now extending parapets and we're doing the face of the building as well as the parking lot. Um, a lot more landscaping along the front of the building and also in the parking lot. And now we're flipping, we've turned around and we're looking <coughs> back west. And this is the corner, um, which I think, if I remember, I think it was Otasco or something years ago there on the corner. Years ago. And now we're coming, we're standing in the middle of Louisville Street, looking back. And here you can see the hotel uh, in the background. And you can kind of see restaurants here and here, hotel, and the shopping center. And so that, hopefully that orients you to where we're talking about and what we're talking about doing in general. Um, again, on the site plan, the scope of work, again, is for uh, two parcels, both restaurants and a hotel, and um, credit union, so not part of this project, is building a new building there. And so hopefully this whole project improves what's been a neglected part of Highway 12 and Starkville for quite a while. Get back to Chris. Thanks, John. <clears throat> The purpose of our hearing tonight is to present the project, to present the tax increment plan, financing plan, and obviously give the citizens an opportunity to comment on the project orally or in writing. The TIF plan describes the project in detail, which includes an 11 and a half acre site and the redevelopment of the Old Coke plant and the State Street Shopping Center. Uh, the plan defines about a $24, $25 million investment in this redevelopment and development effort. The plan authorizes up to $2.1 million in tax increment financing bonds to be utilized for road, water, sewer, stormwater detention and retention, uh, along with uh, parking improvements. Uh, the plan identifies the 11 and a half acre site, which will be the TIF district, which will be where the revenues are derived by the city and county to finance the bonds. The TIF plan describes the economic impact of the project. This redevelopment effort uh, will result in about $15 million in new value being added to the city's and county's tax roll. Uh, presently, the property generates $7,100 a year in ad valorem tax for the city, $16,000 in ad valorem tax for the county, and approximately $26,000 in ad valorem tax for the school district. There are about a million eight in current sales occurring within the development. Uh, which generate about a $23,000 sales tax rebate for the city. After redevelopment of the property, it's expected that the city will have a $31,000 increase in ad valorem taxes, that the county would have a $72,000 increase in ad valorem taxes, and the school district uh, being the largest beneficiary of a $113,000 ad valorem tax increase. Uh, based upon estimated sales of around $26 million, it's expected to to have a $300,000 increase annually for the sales tax rebates of the city generated from this development. Uh, it is expected that the project will create about $110,000 in food and beverage taxes from the tax that is assessed by the city on food and beverage sales, and that lodging taxes resulting from the development will have about a $52,000 impact for the city on your lodging tax. Uh, this TIF plan contemplates that the city and the county would pledge up to 50% of the increase ad valorem taxes and sales taxes for the purposes of retiring the bonds. Uh, this plan has been presented to Octibaha County. They have acted and set a public hearing for uh, Monday the 23rd for their consideration uh, to approve this plan as well. And uh, with that said, Mayor, I'd like to make a couple of general comments about tax increment financing. Great discussion on your previous project. I would like the public to know, I know many of you board members know that, you know, TIF has been around in Mississippi since 1986. Cities and counties throughout the state have utilized TIF uh, very aggressively to induce and encourage economic development. 
TIF has been used uh, over 100 times in Mississippi uh, for uh, projects of this nature, for new development. Uh, South Haven, Mississippi, Olive Branch, Batesville, Columbus, Hattiesburg, Vicksburg, Ridgeland, Jackson. You can look throughout the state and cities and counties have utilized uh, this financing tool to make a difference in their communities, to create investment opportunities and redevelopment opportunities and whether it has been the lack of opportunity in Starkville, Mississippi uh, to utilize TIF or a lack of willingness from previous uh, administrations. You know, I, I don't have a history here to know what the answer is, uh, but your consideration of this tool, I'm biased. I think you're to be commended for it. Uh, but if you look around the state, it has been very successful. And I hope that you get to consider TIF many more times uh, and that I'm before you uh, in the future as it relates to these matters. Um, I do have the public hearing notice, Mr. McLaurin. The notice was duly uh, published in the paper. And with that said, Mayor, I'd open the floor for any comments from your alderman or anyone from the public. Would anyone from the public have a question pertaining to this particular request on TIFs for the Midland Place? Uh, yes. I'm Ivo Burnham, and uh, I live in Long Island Subdivision, which backs up to development and I, just to clarify the existing structures will not be raised there will only be a facade change I'm going to defer to uh, that's correct so that there will be there will be no new construction other than the facade on the shopping center, on the shopping center portion uh, I wonder as a developer uh, having lived in that neighborhood for almost 40 years now and with the previous owners uh, of that shopping center, we've had a continuous problem which has not been dealt with as far as garbage and trash, which the retailers uh, that have been in that location uh, have refused over the years to clean up. Periodically, there's been a little clean up. Is this something that we're going to have to continue to deal with? Uh, well, I can speak to, uh, we've done a preliminary developmental review with uh, the city department head that is part of um, this administration that they put in place requirements on development for simply dealing with dumpsters and trash <coughs> and uh, they're not just laying around where you want to lay them around. So is there a fence proposed uh, backing up the property to separate Chestnut Drive from uh, which has entered the subdivision long out of there behind the retail space? It's not currently a fence proposed, but there would be It is the main entrance to Long Meadow Subdivision, and uh, we have uh, unfortunately over the years had a very unsightly situation and have not been able, uh, with numerous attempts to get that situation cleaned up. Is Bruce going to remain there? It's not part of the development. It's not part of the development, so that property is not in consideration. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to speak on this? Yes. Again, I'd like to However, this is almost exactly what I was looking at with these pit financing for. Um, with the understanding that the existing structures are set back from 12, Highway 12 is slowly but surely becoming a, a nightmare of automobile traffic. And, and nobody here has discussed uh, sidewalks, nor have they discussed potential bus pull offs along 12. Even if you do get a train to running, it's going to stop traffic on 12. So that would need to be encouraged and designed. Well, a designated area for cover space, if you were to. I mean, if you're standing there waiting for a bus, you got to walk half a damn mile to get back to the thing through the parking lot. It's going to be hot, it's raining. It, this is just, it, I understand that for the old building, we're trying to renovate them, but for the two new restaurants with the Pale Trail Inn, all that needs to be switched so that the restaurant is on the street face. It takes away the need for the gigantic signage that is ugly along 12 because the building is there. You don't need a sign to say, hey, drive half a mile back here to this parking lot, look what you find. So, you know, if, if we're going to make public investment, let's do it wisely so that we can have walkable, livable, quality of life that's not automobile dependent. So what I would strongly recommend is, is as the, the city encourages development in the Starkville area, and as much as I commend developers wanting to come here and, and redo these blighted areas, 
we do need to take very seriously the need for planning for the future. And the future is going to include um, people wanting to walk. We have people walking <laughs> up and down 12 all the time. You can see the rutted areas out in the grass, people trying to walk to get food to work. And, and these kind of developments don't foster a comfortable or safe environment for your citizens to walk in. And if you provide avenues for which they can get to these areas safely, you're going to have more business and more uh, people are more willing to shop in these areas if they can see what's there instead of just a parking lot. So I would strongly encourage you that if you are going to publicly invest in these redevelopments, which, as I said, probably 10 times now, I think is worthwhile. Let's do it wisely. Let's do it so the neighborhood of Rome can walk up here in a safe environment to come and eat at the restaurants or whatever it is they want to do and not have to drive even though it's one and a half miles because it's too scary to walk through a public uh, parking space area. If it's going to, for the buildings that already exist, there needs to be a designated pedestrian pathway put through there so that you can come from the sidewalk through the parking lot safely into the shopping plaza. And there's a lot of things that need to be done about this to make smart transit-oriented development. And as we invest, again, um, wisely with this funding, we need to develop wisely with these parts of the community. So I would encourage you to consider those things um, before agreeing to these kinds of developments. Uh, I know out in 182, they've just redeveloped uh, where Red Wings is. Again, parking is in front of the building. It's not sidewalk friendly, it's transit friendly. And as we redo these things, they're great things to be doing it, and I really commend the council for doing them. But we need to do them in a way so that so that students and residents and our elderly can get around in our town and go out for a cup of coffee or get the newspaper, go get something to eat, and not have to pay a dollar per gallon of gas just to get half a mile from their house because this is unsafe. Anyone else? Any of the board members? In regards to what she just said, uh, is there any talks about sidewalks or any other amenities like that to improve walkability around there? I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, Sierra Pate, the, uh, the dealer looking at, there is additional sidewalk. Uh, also, again, as was mentioned, Brewski's is not a part of the development, neither is the uh, Brewski's is private owner of that land. Bank owns and controls their land. The credit union. So basically, the frontage is not controlled by the developer. Uh, so, as far as adding or changing that, it's, it's not part of this plan and out of our control. Uh, <coughs> regarding like the position, is, you know, the other side, there is sidewalk in there. So, where the restaurants are, there is sidewalk across the front. Um, the positioning of having them back in the property, we can have a debate about that. Uh, the Fairfield is positioned so really to provide a buffer from the residents is behind it. So there's a significant landscape buffer. And I think if I was a resident, I'd far rather have the back quiet place of a hotel and the landscape buffer to put people pulling in at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. 12 o'clock in the afternoon, checking the hotel room. So that's, so there's, there was thought in these things. I'm sure we missed things, but there is also balance. Uh, so. Other questions or comments? Are there any other questions? Could you turn the lights on for us, please, sir? Some of us uh, can't see very well. There you go. Thank you. Mayor, I would like to make a brief comment, and, uh, and Ms. McLaurin, you'll have consideration of a couple of other steps for this project. Uh, my clients do own their real estate, stand ready to redevelop it and move the process forward. Uh, so you do have before you tonight, not only consideration of the approval and adoption of the plan, uh, but also uh, the development agreement that will allow them to proceed uh, as well as, uh, which is uh, item 10F, and then you're gonna have I'm sorry, 10F is the approval resolution of the plan. 10I is the authorization for the city to enter into an interlocal agreement with the county for the implementation of the project. And 10J is the development agreement between the city uh, and the developers. 
And those are items I think you may have added in your motion to the consent earlier in the evening. Oh, are you we did we not. Okay. No, we did not. Okay. No, none of this was consent. Right. Okay. Agenda. Oh. You want to make another long speech, man? Probably. Oh, uh, Mr. Gurus, uh, I, I have in front of me and on the agenda, uh, they are listed one, two, three resolutions. Yes. Uh, the first of these is uh, uh, adopting, approving the TIF plan. Yes. The second of these is the interlocal agreement with uh, Octavio County. And the third of these, except I have two, one an agreement with uh, Starkville 12 LLC and one uh, an agreement with uh, Luco Properties LLC. Well, you, the, Which one are we dealing with here? The amended agenda struck both of those individual development agreements and added item J, which combined those. Systems. Because the, we've got two separate developers, but they're developing these projects together, and uh, at the request of Randy Wall, he prefers that the city have one agreement with both developers instead of two separate agreements. He felt that they would be easier to implement in that manner. Um, and I guess that is what I'm looking for here, the one agreement with the two developers. I have one agreement with one developer, one agreement with another, and unless I am overlooking something, you have this. Oh, that's the uh, TIF plan. There was one put in front of us. Uh, okay, the one Ms. Tyndall handed to me is, is one that is not, that I've been able to find on the table entitled Security and Reimbursement Agreement. Yes. Okay. Uh, the order in which these should be adopted you is should, what? You should first approve the adoption and implementation of the financing plan itself. The TIF plan. Yes, sir. And then no particular order to your approval of the interlocal or the uh, Okay. And they will all be separate, of course, yes. Uh, uh, again, the same comments I made prior to the last TIF discussion hold in connection with this TIF discussion. Uh, accordingly, I would offer the following resolutions, uh, which I will not read. Uh, a resolution of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville, Mississippi, approving the adoption and implementation of the Middleton Marketplace Tax Increment Financing Plan, authorizing the issuance of tax increment financing revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $2,100,000, and authorizing certain actions with respect to an in local agreement with Octavio County. So, Mr. Mayor and Board, I would offer and move the adoption of that resolution. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. We will have to individually vote on this again on each one of these resolutions. Mr. McLaurin, how do you vote? Uh, yay. Uh, Mr. Corey? Yay. Mr. Lincoln? Yay. Mr. Cox? Yay. Mr. Perkins? Yay. Mr. Self? Yay. Mr. Davis? Aye. All right, Mr. Second. Okay, we will go uh, with this. Uh, Alderman Cox tells me that given the fact that he just got the security and reimbursement agreement, that he's not in a position to adopt it without having read it. Uh, we might decide to adjourn a minute to read it or something. Uh, let's go to the next one then. Uh, a resolution of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville, Mississippi, adopting, approving, and authorizing the execution of an interlocal cooperation agreement with Octavio County, Mississippi, in support of the Middleton Marketplace Project. And of course, this interlocal cooperation agreement will have to be approved by the county. 
and the Attorney also, General's office. Uh, and the Attorney General's office, certainly. And I would offer and move the adoption of that resolution. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. We will start with roll call. Mr. McLaurin, how do you vote? Yay. Mr. Corey? Yay. Mr. Lincoln? Yay. Mr. Cox? Yay. Mr. Perkins? Nay. Mr. Self? Yay. Mr. Davis? Aye. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I, may I suggest a brief uh, recess for the board to sit down and read through the three or so pages of this security and reimbursement agreement? Yes, we'll now recess for approximately five minutes. The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. Check with Mr. Wall. Tomorrow I will take him a copy and say, is this what you wrote? Uh, since he is not here, and I do not doubt your assurance uh, that he is, uh, if he should say, no, I did not write this, then I will ask the mayor to call a special meeting and we will be rescinding this. Uh, do you follow me? I do, and I would like to state that uh, Mr. Wall has had uh, communication today regarding the matter with your administrator. If I may, I have the email with the attachment you'd like to show. An email coming from Mr. Wall with this resolution attached. Uh, and I certainly do not doubt that, but we'll verify it tomorrow morning. Yes. Okay. Uh, that being the case, Mr. Mayor, I would move that the city approve the security and reimbursement agreement. Uh, bind between the city of Starkville, Mississippi, and Municipal Corporation organized existing on the laws of the state of Mississippi, the city, and Luco Properties, LLC, Luco, Starkville, Mississippi, a limited liability company, duly authorized, existing, and in good standing under the laws of the state of Mississippi, and Starkville 12, LLC, a uh, Starkville 12, Columbus, Mississippi, also a limited liability company, duly organized, and existing, and in good standing under the laws of the state of Mississippi, jointly those two entities being the developer. I would move adoption of this security and reimbursement agreement. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion a second. We will have a roll call vote again. Mr. McLaurin, how do you vote? Yay. Mr. Corey? Yay. Mr. Lincoln? Yay. Mr. Cox? Yay. Mr. Perkins? Yay. Mrs. Self? Yay. Mr. Davis? Yay. It passes with a six to seven. You're all clear to go. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to declare again a little quick three minute recess replacing the city's false alarm ordinance. Clark, you didn't want to? Yes, go ahead. No, you can stay right there. Just tell us who you are for the record. I'm president of the Society, which manages the city of Starkville and Shelter. And I'm also the Thank you. By the way, that's a first for the state of Mississippi again, I believe. Well, it was greatly appreciated to have that process in the municipal court. Another one of those little things we've done in this <laughs> term of office, I believe. <laughs> Okay, so I won't take very long, but, but there were a few comments I, I'd like to provide. Um, there still appears to be in the ordinance and the process the approach of building and improving your image. And that flies against the American idea. And I, I'm hoping. Yeah. 
find that the running violation was occurred before you were in violation with the court. Uh, the pitfall to me is, is that I have tried several times to present information when I've been before the court or the administrative hearing officer about how these warnings were not authorized. That would get me to the point of for the shelter to get it to the point of a violation. Uh, we were told that that is not open before the municipal court, it is not open before the administrative hearing officer. If I had been able to present evidence that would help them understand that our warnings were not violations, which should not have been counted as false alarm, then we wouldn't have been at such a status. So I'm hoping that perhaps something might be worked on in regard to this ordinance, that you don't have this big pitfall that you find yourself in, that, that you can't address or, or make any radiation on it. Uh, I do have trouble, and I think we may be a little unique, somewhat unique in this respect, uh, us being fined or potentially being fined for protection of the animals, which are, in most instances, city animals. There are a few lost animals that are older and they get retrieved, but most of them are city property. We're getting fined trying to protect them from any danger occurring to them. Uh, we are in the position of getting possibly fined for trying to particularly prevent theft. We have had pit bulls there, the owners have wished to retrieve them. And our alarm system has tried to prevent that situation from occurring and to help maybe enable the police to be there in regard to this, but we end up with warnings and citations. That is back to the guilty and have to prove they're innocent. If no one is there when the police arrive, even though someone has jumped over the fence, and in one instance the other slipped in the pit bulls, deposited some nice puppies for us, set off our alarm, because the person wasn't there, we got a false alarm citation. The officer was kind enough to help us round up the puppies in a fenced in area. But we still got a citation. We weren't ours. They were left there by a good citizen sometimes during the night. So we do have issues with trying to protect the city property and then having the city fine us for trying to protect the city property. The building is the city property as well as I said, the animals with a few exceptions. So we were hoping that maybe something could be done in that regard. Uh, in the ordinance proposed, Besides my reading is that you have increased when the citation appearance occurs, under section 2A it says alarms within a calendar year. I understood that to be December, I mean January to December, but I was told this morning in the hearing that the calendar year is from when the ordinance came into place last March until the month before March of this year. And I think it would be helpful if it was just kind of clearly written so we citizens knew what our calendar year framework was. Uh, I do wish that was very considered, where it's January 1 to December 31. It sure would alleviate a lot of confusion. All right, Ms. Brule's taking the notes back there. Yes, sir. I, I assume the calendar year would be so. Mr. Mayor, that seems like that could be simplified if council would put a de uh, definition in section one as to calendar year. Yes. Then that would eliminate that concern, I would think. It was think. brought up because the person ahead of me was having last July stuff. Well, that's the whole point of the public hearing is to streamline some of these issues that we have. Um, and I'll just take a few more moments. Appreciate your attention listening to some of the input that I have. Uh, we don't know at this point when it said that uh, there would be an administrative fine schedule for the citizens to have an awareness of that for like public ignorance uh, modes. We're kind of up in the air what the new schedule would be. I know what the old one is, but the amounts are clearly indicated anywhere we aren't directed to where we can find out what they were. I don't even know if they existed yet or not. It's on the website. Well, I haven't pulled up the new set up the website too. I can't find it. So I'll look again. Thank you. Uh, we had to have so 
Fine. Um, I mean, this is strict, strictly the public hearing which you're entering. These things will be no legislative action tonight. I, I do, again, you know, uh, finding the city finding the city in it. Um, Anyone else would like to speak this time? Yes. Just to Diane's point, I wanted to, to mention on the first issue she had that there is an inconsistency. If you read section two, it says three or more false alarms are prohibited, yet section five, the penalty says over three false alarms. So although previously we had allowed three and then the fourth one became the violation, there's an inconsistency between section two and section five on that number. Pittman, do you have questions? Uh, just a couple of quick comments. I really wasn't going to speak tonight, but uh, just thought I'd like to say a few things. I think everybody knows how I stand on this thing. I really do believe that it's a punitive, that these fines are punitive. And I don't understand why. Uh, there's no other city in the state that has fines anywhere like this. I know that this was an attempt in revising the schedule to make it friendlier, and it did. And I went to the first administrator here. And certainly less expensive in terms of court costs, but there was the, the administrative hearing officer still had zero discretion to make uh, an adjustment. If the police were called out there and there's no emergency, you're going to get fined. It does not matter what the cause was. I mean, that's just that's the way it is, and that's the way the, the officer, uh, the administrative hearing officer has to interpret it. Uh, I think that putting this in the administrative hearing uh, officer's realm of responsibility certainly was an attempt to save some money, but in fact now on the fourth alarm, cost you more now than it did when it was in Judge Issues Court. Because as a courtesy, understanding how severe these fines were, he waived off the fourth alarm. All you had to do was pay court costs. It cost you $100. Now the fourth alarm cost you four, or cost you 200 if you go to court. And the other thing that I'd like to get clear, I did ask Lynn this and she gave me a verbal, and I'm sure she's right, but I guess I'd like to, to, to know publicly or get it stated publicly. If the owner pays the fine and doesn't go to the hearing, does he have to pay hearing costs? No, there's no Okay. Well, that was a bad thing in, in Judge Issues Court. You come in and pay your fine, you still have to pay court costs, even though it never got before his bench at all. And I thought that was wrong. But, I, but my big problems with this ordinance are the, the level of the fines. They're, they're incredibly expensive. It's very punitive. And it's not representative of the cost of the city. There's certainly, if we're putting officers in danger, I don't disagree with that. But the fines are punitive. It does not cost the city $300 to file an officer with 10 million. Uh, it's still very unfair for large users we're treating people with 50,000 square foot buildings with alarm systems that have 300 components in them, the same way we're treating a 1,500 square foot house over in Timber Cove. That's not right. 
start with uh, Academy just got through paying $600 in fines last a couple of weeks ago for alarms that happened almost a year ago. How they got thrown back up, I don't know, but, but they happened, they were, they were fined two weeks ago for alarms that happened last June. I think it was a paper chase and the administrative hearing officer going back and cleaning up the record. But why the city feels it necessary to be so aggressive in doing this is still a mystery. I believe that this could all be accomplished with fines in the $50 to $100 range, which is the way most cities do it, and accomplish the same thing, which is make people take their alarm seriously. There is no debating how well this alarm ordinance works. That is not a debate. I don't know the numbers, but I'm assuming the false alarms are one third of what they were two years ago, maybe less. But it has a lot of uh, businesses and a lot of uh, uh, citizens very angry at the city and the police department. And I don't understand why. I just don't think it's necessary. Uh, I think that's really all I have to say. I just, it is what it is, and we'll deal with it hopefully at some point in the future. But, uh, but I believe the fines are excessive. I believe they're still excessive. And just want to go on record to say that. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, my name is Adam Trump. Uh, where is the animal trigger the alarm? Uh, like dog, cats, snake, you know. At the Humanity for Animals, their building that is out on Industrial uh, Road, I believe. It's kind of isolated out there, so it's susceptible to a lot of these particular issues that uh, Ms. Walls, Dr. Walls, is bringing up. <coughs> well, I'm, that's what I'm telling him, that you have an isolated situation that is not in clear view of the public out there. And so, consequently, people feel like a free for all to do whatever they're doing out there. Well, what I, I'm, I'm referring to homeowners owners that have pets in their home. Yes. That uh, you might have a side of love and dog might too. A uh, cat might too. That is not the society, society people that have given in home that have pets. I think they're probably aware that that's a potential for the pets to do that. And they may take other precautions. Is that not right, Mr. Pittman? Uh, it's my understanding that if a pet does set off an alarm, that, that's not considered an emergency. And that's homeowner would be fine. fine for it, yes. But I'm saying after two or three times, that homeowner would make adjustments to that animal setting them off if that were the case going on all the time. A dog or cat might be outside or whatever, a snake, what you're saying. But yes, that's a problem. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. One thing I did forget and that brought it up is because I'm aware of some of my friends that their answer is that they're not using their alarm systems. They're not as protected as they are. They don't use their alarm systems because of the stress of this whole situation. I don't use my alarm system. I use mine every day. Any other questions? Any other questions for board members? I like just to, yes. Well, just Alderman McLaurin asked if we would not consider this at a courtesy forum. And um, going back to when we implemented this, it, the intent was to deal with the chronic abusers. We were presented with information that this was primarily big companies who had alarms that were malfunctioning and that they were simply not repairing them or maintaining them and that's the, it was the intent of the ordinance as was presented to the board and, and what Dr. Wall and, and others have represented tonight and, and letters to the board and emails to the board and calls is that we were trapping and ensnaring uh, regular homeowners in this and that was not the intention of the ordinance um, and certainly the type of fines that we're looking at here, it looks more as, it is punitive and it is revenue generating as opposed to uh, trying to accomplish what we had set out to do. And so when we talk about this at the next meeting, I think it's appropriate to allow additional public comments and, and consider more substantial changes to address the problem that we set out to, but not to punish homeowners. 
Thank you, Mr. Cox. Anything else to be said? I would agree with that. I actually tend to think that part of the problem is how we define what constitutes a false alarm and, you know, checking on that very definition. And actually, Ms. Wall, you, you make some good points. Dr. Wall, you, um, you might want to even maybe over the next two weeks speak to our CAO, maybe come by and talk to her and work on ways we can revise that definition so that when we come back before the at our next meeting that we can uh, look how best to resolve that. I call this public meeting uh, hearing closed. We will now go back to the original part of our agenda and we're now open for <laughs> citizens' comments. We've had comments from the citizens all night tonight and do the, any additional people would like to get up and take their moment. <laughs> Jesus, Al. Good evening to the mayor and board. Um, citizen, that we, that uh, Mayor Kent, we, we thank you for uh, what you have did the last three years. Uh, you kept us together even after the passing of uh, uh, Mayor Ruffin, and we appreciate that. Uh, Vice Mayor Perkins, that we don't understand. That we we frustrated at uh, uh, the uh, double mindedness that we get frustrated. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Evan, will you clarify the form so I understand what you're talking about? Huh? Tell me what you mean. What, what, are, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to? What message are you trying to convey? That we don't understand. Don't understand what? What is it? Uh, we uh, we want to try to move forward. We that we trying to pay catch up, and uh, we just spin the wheels, not getting anywhere. So what? What is it that I'm doing that you don't understand? That's that is serious. Nothing. But what is it the citizen understand? I want a specific answer. I want to know. Uh, uh, you might tell us one thing, and then you come to the meeting and do something different. If what have I told you that I've done different? That's coming from the citizen. Well, you not, made, you not made, me. <laughs> you made it, uh, the statement to the public. I want to know what is it specifically that I told somebody and did different. That's what I want to ask you. You have to find that from the citizen. I mean, uh, we come here to take care of business and keep the city going. But so, then so, we run into So problems. you can't answer my question, right? Huh? So you don't have an answer to my question, what I'm asking. You say that oh. I, I say one thing to the public and do a different thing here, so you don't have an answer to my question. That's what I'm asking you. Well, we want to know why. I mean, what what is it? I don't understand what you're saying. You're not making any sense to what you're, what you're saying. Well, that comes from the system. Thank you. Y'all's three minutes is up. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Anyone else from Puck like to get up and use your three minutes? Okay, we'll move on. It brings us up to down to uh, public appearances. And the first we have tonight is presentation proposed budget for the by Mississippi State, 2% tax uh, on the beverage tax funds, and uh, we have three representatives here tonight. Y'all pull the chair up with you. Appreciate your patience tonight, gentlemen. I believe what you have in your packet is a, uh, I should introduce myself, I'm Bill Kibler. I'm Vice President for Student Affairs at Mississippi State, Bill Broyles, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, and our Student Body President, Braxton Cook, is here this evening. Uh, we had two things that we sent forward, one of which was revised <clears throat> just earlier today because of some additional information. So we had a, a budget sheet that I believe you have in your packet and then an accompanying uh, memo that came with that a few days ago. Uh, so thought I would just briefly make a comment or two on the items on the uh, uh, on the budget. You'll see down below, uh, starting from the bottom and then go back up, a total of $274,000 uh, projected distribution of funds for the coming year. Uh, that comes from a revenue projection that we uh, uh, had some discussions with uh, the city about a uh, a reasonable revenue projection of $250,000 in the coming year. And then uh, just within the last two days, we've made the final entry based on the final check that we will be able to log in for our fiscal year from the city 
that uh, actually placed us for, the, for this fiscal year $24,000 in surplus, which is good news because we've not been there in the past three years, so, so we're, we're in the black for the first time, which is great. And so that's why we did a, a revision, so you should have gotten a, 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 this revised sheet, and what we did was applied that $24,000 uh, to the night route above. Uh, so what you see are the distribution that we're proposing of the six items that we would propose to uh, spend that $274,000. This is, uh, uh, although not exact, it's, it's very consistent with what we have allocated this funding for in the past, which we've had two primary principles that we've tried to follow in the allocation of the 2% uh, sales tax allocation, uh, which our students particularly are very much appreciative of and have been for the last three years while we've been able to do this moving into the fourth year and that's to enable them to uh, have the financial support for activities programming uh, uh, entertainment other kinds of uh, uh, activities that students primarily uh, make the decisions about they do the planning on they put these forward and offer them uh, for our students as well as for the university and the Starkville community. Our priority has been on, on, on two approaches, one of which is to uh, uh, work with the students on those kinds of programs or activities that directly move people into or place people in the city of Starkville uh, that assumes therefore that they're going to, by virtue of being there, uh, spend their money in the city and therefore help contribute to further uh, enhancing the uh, uh, tax revenue of the city or otherwise to, uh, to support programs that, that not only are attractive to our students but also bring uh, people from uh, outside the city of Starkville. The example would be things like concerts that are offered, the Lyceum series, speaker series, those kinds of programs. Uh, that bring that attract not only students but also attract people from around this region to come to the city uh, and we don't serve food at any of those events so if these are things that people come from outside the city we're uh, uh, assuming that they would visit restaurants and others in the community and also therefore bring uh, revenue to the city uh, the distribution amounts are virtually the same as we had a year ago with one notable exception the additional revenue coming into here has really been devoted all to one to one particular program in addition to the $24,000 surplus and that's the night route. Uh, the night route's funding for the last three years has been $17,000 each year. Uh, this year uh, it will be $79,000 for the coming year. A dramatic increase. The Student Association has come forward with a, an excellent plan that we think finally puts the night route on a plan for I think what we all intended way back at the beginning, and that is that wanting to have very uh, consistency on the nights that it will um, that it will travel into the city Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, that they will begin running the buses earlier. The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. Throughout the year, Bulldog Bash you're all familiar with, which is the largest student-sponsored uh, entertainment event in the state of Mississippi, and it continues to have great success. The Old Main Music Festival, as conceived by our students as it's evolved, is to be sort of the equivalent of Bulldog Bash in the spring. Um, a free major concert where different organizations pool their funds to offer that event. The Lyceum Series, as you know, is the arts entertainment uh, uh, series for the university that also draws folks from throughout the, the region. And diversity programming primarily uh, supports uh, diversity-related speakers that are Holmes Cultural Diversity Center and the students that work in that center uh, sponsor those programs. Uh, it's not their only source of funding. This is one of several sources of funding that help support uh, diversity speakers throughout the year that also attract uh, visitors to our campus. Um, so that's, that's our proposal. We'll certainly 
available to answer questions that you may have about this bill. Any of the board members have questions they would like to ask about this proposed budget? Richard? Uh, not a question. I'm ready to make a motion. Later. I'd like to say something before we do this. Uh, in reviewing this, that uh, there's approximately $274,000 that were taken from the taxpayers in, within the city here. And by my calculations, I only see approximately 109000 with the increase of the night ride that is spent with back within the city limits of the city. Uh, you have moved the old main district uh, festival back out onto the campus from the main street of the city. One of the issues that you, we haven't talked about is the down in the district, uh, which drew about 20,000 people, I believe, the last time that they had it. Uh, which has been removed two years ago out onto the campus again and I understand that those two items were combined were they not yes sir and was the attendance of the combined item items did they reach 20 something thousand people or was it around 12,000 I guess by estimations it'd be more around 12,000 people so what we're saying here is that we substituted a 12,000 participation for something combined that was within the city limits for about uh, 25 or 26,000. Give or take a couple of thousand here and give or take a couple of thousand so there. Point being is that uh, I'm not opposed to student activities. That's not, not the point. And I uh, feel comfortable with the <coughs> monies that are allocated for the students and their activities. I feel very uncomfortable as the mayor of the city not to be able to point out how these monies were changed about two years ago of the allocation of the events that were happening within the city limits. And if you don't think that some of these chains of events do not affect the local businesses, you got another thought coming. It had a big effect in removing them from the community out onto the campus. I would like for the Alderman to please take that into consideration with Mr. Corey's motion. Uh, as I look around, I see about five people whose jobs are dependent upon the university. And I'm sure if I were to veto it, it'd probably be overruled. But the public needs to be aware that these allocations should be questioned about where the tax monies are going. If it generated within the city limits of the star of Mississippi, the majority of these monies should be free spent within the city limits of the city. That's where they generated. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second of that motion? I, made you, motion. I thought you made one. I'm about to. All right, go ahead. Um, but first, let me say, I guess I tend to abide by the rising tide philosophy. Events, whether they're on campus or in the city, benefit us as a community. That said, I would move approval of the proposed fiscal year 2009 sales tax allocation for the university with the $24,000 left over from last year going towards the night route. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor Mr. say Mayor, aye. Mr. Mayor, yes. before you call for the vote, yes. are you in favor of the motion? No, I'm not in favor of it. Let me just briefly say, um, you know, let me just say this um, statement just as a preface here. Uh, my constituents did not send me up here as a rubber stamp for anything. I, I make decisions as to what I think is in the best interest of my ward in the city of Starkville. Um, I want to say uh, that I do support the mayor's comments. Uh, I likewise am not opposed to student-related activities. Uh, I am uh, the only alderman on this board uh, uh, that was here when this 2% um, uh, tax was uh, promulgated, uh, adopted, and implemented. Uh, I uh, strongly supported the, the revision of the formula for the uh, students to get 20% um, uh, of the allocation of the 2% tax dollars. I strongly support Mississippi State University. I received two degrees, a master's and a bachelor's degree. I have a daughter who now attends Mississippi State University. So I, I want the record to be that I, I fully support our land grant institution. We're proud of what the students are doing, what uh, what the university is doing. But nevertheless, uh, you know, the mayor makes a very good point, and we have to always be cognizant 
of what is um, uh, best for our city. And, you know, we have to make these decisions. A lot of times they're not uh, popular to some, but we just have to make them uh, and live with them. You know, it, we just have to be strong leaders at this table. When you make the decision, you have to stand by it. Uh, the mayor raises some good points that, you know, that, um, and, and I concur with it, that we should see more of these um, tax dollars expended within the corporate limits. I have nothing against either of these um, um, organizations that are recipients of these 2% uh, tax dollars. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, I would like to see the university uh, um, revise this particular formula and uh, spend more than $109,000 in, um, uh, in this city. Uh, now, if the mayor does affix his uh, veto to this, I'm going to tell you right now, as I look in your face, I'm going to vote to sustain the veto. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and reluctantly vote for this. Uh, if uh, you come back in the future, I would like to see more uh, monies utilized within our corporate limits. Um, we uh, need to further our spirit of cooperation in that you are getting uh, the 20% allocation to benefit the students, but at the same time, let's uh, spend that money in the community where we all benefit from. And um, I trust and hope that the university will do that. I say this respectfully, not demeaning at all. But I'm going to go ahead and, and reluctantly support this motion. But if the mayor um, uh, fixes his veto, I'm going to vote to sustain the veto because the mayor makes a very good point on this, and I agree with his comments on it. Well, can I make at least a comment or two? Sure. One of which is I, I take a bit of disagreement with your comment earlier that we're taking $274,000 of tax revenue away from the city. There are 17,000 uh, residents of this community that are the students at Mississippi State that also spend their money in this city. And as I understand, you, perhaps you were the only alderman that was on the board at the time, that the allocation of this funding to come was prefaced on this whole idea that the students are a big part of generating tax revenue in the city already, just based on the activities that they already do, regardless of these kinds of events. Nearly all of these events of which were not happening at all before, uh, before this began. Bulldog Bash was happening, but it was much smaller than this. There was virtually no money uh, for the Music Makers productions to be done. The night route didn't even exist before this money was made available to enable the students to be able to do this. Um, uh, the, the diversity programming money didn't exist. And so, but plus the fact we have uh, th th this expectation uh, that a certain portion or expectation that a, a percentage of this money be spent within the city limits of Starkville is a brand new expectation that we've never heard before until the last two weeks. Our student body president has heard that because we allow our students to make the decisions about these programming things, not only about the content of them, but where they occur. He's heard this, he made the commitment earlier today to take this concern back to the students who are the decision makers on our campus that will plan these kinds of events, to consider the idea of the future location, for instance, of Old Main Music Festival, even consider the location of some of the entertainment things that the Music Maker Productions may do to provide that feedback for them to take that into consideration on the planning of these in the future. I can't sit here right now in terms of this fiscal year and this allocation to promise you that a certain percentage of these dollars would be spent on programming within the city because I don't make those decisions. I provide advice and counsel, but the students make those decisions. And therefore, we've heard that feedback and the students will take that, this, this student leader will take that back and will work with the others as they return this fall to give strong consideration to that. And that may be enhanced in this coming year. Uh, but, but clearly, I think from a fairness perspective, this expectation to spend a certain portion of this within the confines of the city limit is an expectation we only heard within about the last two weeks. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll take that into consideration and that will go forward. But I think it's also important, as I said before, that we're not taking $270,000, of tax revenue away from the city. Uh, we are, we meaning the students, primarily when I'm saying we, because we work with them, 
are a big part of helping generate that tax revenue for the city. And so some of that's coming back. And we consider it an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to try to figure out a way to use some of that money to actually generate more tax revenue from the city. That tax revenue has been going up every year. And so I think this partnership, this collaboration between the city and the, and the university has in fact been successful. We're not the only reason that the tax revenue has been going up, but we think we're a part of why that tax revenue has been going up. And we're doing lots of things also to continue to aggressively grow the enrollment of the university, bringing more students to this campus, and therefore that will also continue to generate more tax revenue as we have more residents here in the city that are spending their money in the Starkville community. So thank you very much. We have a motion on the floor. I'll now call for a vote. All those in favor of this budget, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. It passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Ms. Shanks, is she, she here? Is that okay? Pardon me? To stay in, is that That's okay? That's fine, yes. Thank you, Mayor, and to the Board of uh, Aldermen. I'm here before you tonight to talk about a program that we operate within the city and the <coughs> county, uh, uh, Tippecanoe County. Experience Works is a national nonprofit employment and training program that assists individuals that are 55 and older to get back into the workforce. Basically what we do, we work with uh, any nonprofit that's a 501c3 or any government agency to place them in an area of training. And what we've come before the uh, board tonight to see if the city would be interested in, in uh, becoming a host agency for uh, individuals that will qualify for our program within the, within the, um, within the city. Individuals have to be uh, it's more like a relegated to individuals that are limited or low income individuals. And what happens is, um, in my opinion, it's a win win situation. What happened is that uh, if the city is interested in any of the individuals, you get free labor, so to speak, because we pay them uh, to work in your organization for 20 hours a week. We pay them basically minimum wage. And what's happening with the participants so that they are getting training. At some point, we transition those individuals from the organization and help them to find a job within the, within the city. And there again, they become taxpaying citizens as well. So that is the reason we're before you tonight to see if you want to adopt this program and to see if you're interested in um, uh, having this program to operate within the city. Any questions? Questions from Alderman. What other cities in Mississippi we operate in, in Mississippi, we operate in 24 counties in Mississippi. We are one of 10 national sponsors of the Title V monies, and we are territorialized. Um, uh, there's an organization operating in the Delta, there's another organization that operates in the South, so we are in mostly north central Mississippi. So we are in the state, uh, we are in, uh, I think, 50, uh, yeah, 24 counties within the state mentioned counties just as a follow-up is this something that's better dealt with at the county level or do you work with cities within those counties we work with the county and also with the cities we work with any government agency any nonprofit that's the 501c3 would any it, of them workers would it make sense to knowing that Starkville is a part of Octavia County to, to work with Octavia County since that would encompass all of the residents not just in Starkville but, but would it make more sense for you to, to go to Octavia County to present this knowing that Starkville is just a part of Octavia County and that would include all of the communities around us Sturgis and Maven etc. Um, right I we have done that the county and the city we have went before the county as well okay. is that what you're asking me uh, sure okay yes and we have made a presentation to the to the uh, board of supervisors and uh, they were interested in the program, but we haven't got any further than they are being interested at this time. Anyone else got questions? Ms. Seth, you have anything to ask? No, I, I understood clearly what she was saying um, about the program and that they pay the workers. Exactly. Yes. 
that they would be working for us. Uh, they would be placed in some of our departments, under some of our department heads. Right, as a but it's free labor to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, but are we expected to hire them at a later time no, when this program expected, runs out? No, you're not expected to hire them, but we always so encourage it if there's a position that comes available, you know, to offer to them if they will qualify, but you're not expected to hire them. What we're trying to do is to get them some on-the-job training, and at some point we will transition them from their host agency into a job within the community. Have you discussed this with our personnel director? I have before. Okay. And are you on board with this, Randy? <clears throat> yes, Mayor. I, I am familiar with the program. I think it's an excellent program to provide training to the, um, in order for employees to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are available to them. Uh, but it's our understanding that the program would have to agree to be a host agency. Uh, Does that mean we have to provide an office? No. Okay. No. Uh, the only thing, if we had positions where we were able to use some of their uh, uh, candidates, then you know, we would provide a place for them to work, we would provide the supervision for them while they were on the job, but uh, uh, their program would pay the, the person's wages, uh, we would use them for uh, a period of time that we would determine and uh, would be under no obligation. So is this something that the board, based on Mr. Boyd's, uh, uh, would be very interested in adopting? Uh, and one other comment, and I'm not sure we may have missed this, that these are senior uh, workers. These are not young people. Right, 55 um, years or right. older. Mm -hmm. That's dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, sir. While they work, these, uh, these people are not employees of the city. They're not covered by right. city benefits or anything at all. And we do carry workers' compensation on all of our participants. 55 year olds or older sometimes in the right positions end up making pretty good uh, mm -hmm. people to work for. Them. Is there a, an agreement, Randy, yeah. that we. Yeah, so that's a whole stages agreement. And yeah, since we don't have that agreement tonight, would it make sense to say, I think around the table people, you know, are nodding their heads, sounds like we're something we're interested in, and that would be something you could present that we could take up for consideration at a future meeting? Yeah, he has the copy of that. Okay. But since we haven't seen it, Randy, does that make sense to? Absolutely. Okay. Could you bring it to us back at the uh, first meeting of July, perhaps? Sure. If the agenda doesn't have four public hearings on it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this brings us down to uh, some of the items on uh, board business. First item is that of discussion and holding ward meetings of several selected topics of importance to the community and representative wards. Uh, Sproul, did you put this on here or what? Uh, certainly, it's always important to um, have you know, a constant interaction with um, your constituents. I try to do that anyway. As a matter of fact, uh, Ms. Brewer, is there anything in particular you'd like for me to share at my award? I'll be having a ward meeting uh, already. Got one scheduled with some of my constituents for uh, this coming Thursday uh, with a group of citizens. So I try to have those um, with them. Uh, sometimes they're requested, and sometimes I meet with a group of people. But um, I'll be meeting with some people, and I didn't know whether he had anything of particular interest in. I'm, 
and and I try to just have you know keep my constituents informed in, uh, at all times. Or when they call me, I'll be readily available. Had a lady from Trotter Lane come into the office today, and of course, at all people come to my office all the time. So, but I try to keep them available. So if there's anything particular that you like me to mention to my constituents when I meet with them at a ward meeting this coming Thursday at 6 p.m., I'll be happy to do so. And of course. And when I saw this on the agenda, I, I, I'm not against this now, but I just wonder what precipitated it. But I, I, I try to, and I've done that, you know, try to keep my citizen constituent informed throughout my 15 years on this board. So, but I but want to applaud we you for your efforts. One, uh, if you think about it, two years ago, uh, Roy added the Griffin. We did, we did. I'm not against that, but if Lynn, if you have anything you want me to share with them, I'll do it. I appreciate that. I was not aware that you were doing that on a regular basis. It's what? very minimal. It's, this was just one of those things that we had discussed. Is there any other discussion? If not, we'll move on. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Our next item, item uh, Richard, I believe, is one of yours with TELPAC. TELPAC, yes, sir. TELPAC. Um, actually, I'm going to be asking for your consideration, not for an actual vote tonight on this issue, because I wanted to check on a few other details with this in regards to this. But what this boils down to is, as you are already aware, we've been working actively with the police department in retrofitting their police vehicles with onboard computer units, and those are going to need to be in contact with City Hall and the police station. However, that's going to create a, a significant amount of increased bandwidth for the city, which we currently, with our current internet service provider, are not able to, to handle. And so one of the suggestions made was to talk to the people that work with Megapop, which you may also remember we gave right away approval to put their big fiber optic backbone through the area. Um, and Telepac is the company that works with them in providing that internet service. And so what we're going to essentially be looking at at the next meeting is an increase in the amount of available bandwidth for City Hall, which the best analogy I can give you to that is it's like when you have a lot of new development, you have to increase the size and pressure of your water pipes often. And this is sort of the, the digital equivalent of that. And because of the increased usage we're going to need, we're going to have to look at something along those lines. So I would just ask you to look over this information. If you have any questions, to please ask me. And then at the next board meeting, I'd like to bring it up for a motion. Thank you. Uh, our next item is that in which we took off the consent because Mr. Perkins wants to be on record of voting against it, okay. and that is the adopting of the proposed business and Senate policy. Do we have any discussion, or do we have a motion and a second? <coughs> Again, he wanted it taken off the consent so he could vote against it on record. So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor <coughs> say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Uh, if we'll skip through our items. I believe it gets down to the department business, and they shall look through to see if I've left anything out. First item on park business is all consent of the airport. Brings us down to the building codes planning department. Uh, I said one item which could have been consent on there. Can we go ahead and do it? Uh, can we go ahead and approve it? Yeah, let's approve item four and be travel. So maybe on item four. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Ben, it brings you down with three items. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. The first item is um, PZ item FP08-04, which is a request by Mr. Andre Taylor of the Brick Fire Project for approval of a final plat for Elsco subdivision located in an R2 single-family duplex zoning district. The subject property is located at the northeastern corner of Westside Drive and Frontier Street in Ward 7. The final plat consists of six single-family residential lots on approximately 1.23 acres of land. All public utilities are in place and easements have been dedicated to the city. The city department heads have all approved the final plat as proposed. Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously approved the final plat with four standard conditions of approval on March 11, 2008. 
planning staff has added a fifth condition that a note drafted by the city attorney be added to the recorded plat prior to execution and recording at the Octavia Hall County Chancery Clerk's Office to comply with Senate Bill 2391. Michelle, you had an opportunity to look at that. And, uh... Uh, I have, and so I won't be uh, Alderman McLaurin. Uh, attorney, Baker, how much of this do I need to include in this motion? <laughs> uh, the last part, That's, but where you, he's already made that. You just, you can just say that, uh, that subject to the recommendations <coughs> of staff. Okay, that. You don't have to go through. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I move the approval of the uh, final subdivision plat of El Elsco. Subdivision. Second. Have a motion second. Those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. It passes. Uh, the next item this evening is PNC item RZ08 05, which is a request by Mr. Paul Roberts of Greenway Inc. for a zoning change from C1 neighborhood commercial to R40 lot line cluster development. The subject property is located on the western side of Louisville Street, south of the Lutheran Church, southwest of the intersection of Academy Road and Ward 2. The property consists of approximately 2.45 acres of undeveloped land. The applicant wishes to develop the property for zero lot line, single family residential use. The applicant provided handouts to the Planning and Zoning Commissioners at the public hearing and copies have been included with your packets. One adjacent property owner attended the public hearing and spoke in support of the request, stating that it would add value to her property. The Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously recommended approval of the rezoning request based on changing conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Mayor, there, I will make sure there's no private drive. There's no private. It's not a private drive. The, I just, I just this is just a rezoning. Oh, okay, I just make sure. Okay. All right. There's no site or anything okay. like that. Yes, no, sir. Not yet. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion? <coughs> so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Motion with a second. Ben, All of just a quick question, Ben. So they determined that there was a change in condition from C1 to R4? Is that the determination that they yes, made? Sir. And the surrounding other properties are C1, 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 and R5? Right. The, the properties that are zoned C1 are actually um, used for apartments and multifamily use. So. They're actually not conforming uses with the with the zoning standards for the zoning district. The Planning Zoning Commission went into a great discussion about that these were non conforming uses that we went into a whole discussion about how that could occur and, and so forth and it was explained and if it burned down they couldn't build them back and so forth. So they felt although it was C1 is the actual zoning, the uses are not conforming with that, and so they felt this change will be more consistent with what's going on in that particular area. But so that's why you, when you look at it and you see C1, 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 and you see what the uses are, like the apartment complex right there, that's, that wouldn't be allowed in C1. If that academy crossing burned down, she couldn't rebuild it with the current zoning it has. It's a non-conforming use, it's basically grandfathered in. Or the, are the conditions that we say are changing, are the conditions that have changed the non-conforming use or areas surrounding these non-conforming uses? How, how do you mean? I'm not sure I follow. Well, if it's zoned, we just said that the neighborhood has changed, right? Or the area has changed. That's the, that is the, the allowable reason for rezoning. The, the uses of the land has changed. <clears throat> the zoning Mr. Faber was saying the zoning is C1, but the uses are actually not C1 uses. But if the uses are non-conforming and they couldn't be put back, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you can use that as a definition of things changed if that's the exception, not the rule. I'm not sure I follow. Yeah. We're yeah, wanting because to one of the, what we have to look at is you, you use the terminology, the character. Mm -hmm. You don't look specifically to the zoning itself, you look to the character of the neighborhood and how it's being used besides the zoning itself. So in, in essence, in this in this situation, what, what would happen is she's going to come in and she's going to ask for a rezoning now because she didn't understand that her property was C1. So that's what's about to take place. But 
what you're looking at and, and not only the zoning itself and I guess I, you got to use the word character of the neighborhood and that's what the board or the commission focused on when they made their decision in this case but for example she's going to come in and she's going to ask you to rezone her property based on the actual use of it as opposed to C1 so and I guess you have to look at the I guess the answer to your question is the character as opposed to the actual zoning itself. But zoning it is a factor you can look at also, but also character is too. Well, it seems like a slam dunk for Academy when they come in and ask for a rezoning because of the way they're actually using it, and that gets rid of the non-conforming use, assuming that it was approved. We had a dollar general store down there in this vicinity it came in, if you remember, Mr. Perkins. Yes, sir. And that was before this board convened, I believe. Yes, sir. And the argument was is that they uh, wanted a rezoning uh, for commercial, which is right across the street from this. Mm -hmm. And all of the people that had offices and other things on Academy Road opposed Dollar General doing that. And they were also willing to say uh, conform to the type of building that everybody else had there, and they were denied the change, I believe, that's is correct. that not correct? Yes, sir, that's Across correct. the street from this, which was yes, C1. So that, to me, within its effect, has changed the characteristic of this C1, all right? You've already denied a person to get to build a, a, a commercial endeavor across the street from this. And that was They would not change it. That was... Was that not discussed? That was discussed in the Planning and Zoning Commission, too. That was brought up, the fact that that... Dollar General was denied previously. That so they discussed. Like we've, previous board has done a finding of fact that the neighbor has changed. C one's not appropriate. Correct. Right. That that was discussed by the planning and zoning commission. Gotcha. Was there a second? If not, I'll be glad. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Uh, uh, all those opposed nay. Brings it down to you. Last item here, Ben. Um, the last item is PNZ item RZ08-09, which is a request by George McKee and Harold Gordon for a zoning change from R2 single-family duplex to R5 multifamily high density. The subject property is located at 505 Louisville Street to the north of the Walgreens Pharmacy on the northeastern corner of Louisville Street and Highway 12 West. The property consists of a large single-family residential structure on approximately 1.1 acres of land. The applicant has indicated that he would like to separate the utilities and create two separate dwelling units if the rezoning is approved. The location of the subject property between commercial properties at the south and residential properties to the north lend itself well to this type of transitional use. No citizen comments were made at the public hearing. Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously recommended approval of the rezoning request based on changing conditions in the neighborhood. In the the residents, if you remember the last time this came up, were overwhelmingly supportive of this particular rezoning. Although that's not a consideration in the planning and zoning. I know it's not committed to consideration, they didn't but I'm just consider that, you. but they were asked publicly, and I think we have public comments and probably on camera that they were very much in favor uh, and would be uh, willing to uh, go to an R5. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I move that we approve the rezoning based on the changing of conditions in the area as recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Nay. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the City Star for Claim Docket as of June 12, 2008 as presented. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, this brings us down to uh, fire departments, all the consent, personnel's consent, uh, public services, except for number one on that, and that is a request approval of a contract with a utility for wastewater treatment. Electric department. Uh, oh, yeah, the electric department. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. We had that on consent. And we took it all. We'll go back to the electric department, uh, Edward. <clears throat> Jumped all over the place with this agenda. <laughs> okay. Mayor Board. Uh, 
Sure. In your packet, you'll find a revised budget. And in that revised budget, uh, I made two uh, corrections. Uh, the rent on electric property, uh, instead of 75000 I changed that to 90000 And on salaries, <coughs> uh, I removed the 5% uh, funding uh, for any potential uh, salary adjustments. And I established a new account uh, entitled uh, Emergency Operations Fund and placed that uh, funding from the salaries uh, uh, in that uh, line item. Uh, I would request that uh, the board uh, approve this budget and um, with these necessary, with these changes. Mr. Mayor, may I be recognized very briefly? You can. Uh, Mr. Hannaway, just a couple of quick things. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we're not going to rehash our last session on Thursday. A uh, couple of things. Your current budget contains an increase in compensation for meters. Am I correct? That's correct. Your current budget for the upcoming fiscal year contain an increase in compensation for the right-of-way crew. Is that correct? That's correct. And your um, budget, excuse me, the contract uh, for both of those uh, group of contract personnel do not uh, mandate or require the board to increase that compensation at this time. Am I correct? That's correct. Now, uh, Mr. Hathaway, I want to commend you for um, taking the, the, the leadership as department head to um, remove the salaries from that line item, the 5% increase, and putting it into a new separate line item because you definitely need a um, rainy day fund because you're operating from month to month with a zero beginning fund balance and a zero ending fund balance. But I'm going to vote against this budget for this reason and, and for this reason alone that our um, city employees are just as valuable as contract personnel. To do otherwise suggests that the contract personnel are more valuable than city employees. And therefore, I'm going to res respectfully uh, uh, vote against your budget. Because in all essence, there's no mandatory provision you know, uh, that requires uh, the city to give uh, these contract personnel uh, this increase. I mean, they negotiated their own increase in pay when they met with the city of Starker as to entering into this legal and binding contract. So there's nothing mandatory as you have just admitted to that requires us or mandates this board to give a contract uh, a contractual increase at this time. And plus, you don't have the money. I mean, you know, you just operate from month to month. That's a risky and a dangerous way to operate a company. You know, we had a $1.3 million deficit last year. You overestimated uh, revenues in excess of $3 million. So, but I'm going to close out by saying that those are the, that's why I'm voting against the budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Any other comments from Mr. Hathaway? We had a presentation all of you were here for. Mr. Mayor. Mayor and Board, um, Mr. Perkins is correct as far as the contracts as to how they stipulate for the raises. Uh, I think the board needs to know that, uh, and the public needs to know that these two contractors form a vital part of the operation of the electric department. The right-of-way crew is the are the people that keep the trees off the line and keep and help keep the lights on in this town. Uh, the last time they had a raise was over two years ago. The meter readers, these contract meter readers, have been with me now almost eight years, and they have never asked for a raise. Matter of fact, when the when the contract was rebid uh, a year and a half ago, um, 
they actually dropped the rate because they wanted to be able, uh, they dropped the electric rate, they kept the water rate where it was because they wanted to be able to stay and do the job here in Storm. Uh, the only reason that they are asking for this raise is because of economic stress, period. Uh, the employees, full-time employees, uh, you know, uh, the board knows my stance on that. I feel like we're underpaid to begin with in the uh, uh, doing the job that, that uh, some of my men do, quite a few of my men do. Uh, but that's, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for uh, assistance for the uh, contractors. Uh, basically, with the rate increase for the uh, meter readers, you're looking at about $1,600 a month extra for the contract uh, line crew. I mean, I, uh, right away crew, you're looking for $576 extra a month or, or $7,000 annually. Uh, I'm not asking for a whole lot for these men. Times are tough. That they are. Mr. Mayor, yes. if I can offer a motion, I move that we approve the electric department budget for the fiscal year 2008-2009 beginning July 1. 2008 and ending June 30th, 2009. Second part of the motion is that we would consider uh, cost of living increases and other salary actions for the electric department uh, in concert with the rest of the city employees has been our board practice. Um, and those discussions would happen later this summer for uh, consideration for October 1st, uh, which is the city's fiscal year. And then the third part of the motion would be to um, allow uh, CPI increases for the contractor services, uh, which includes meter reading and right away, uh, and authorize the mayor to sign any appropriate agreements associated uh, with those CPI increases. Do we have a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All those opposed, nay. Nay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mayor. This does bring us now down to uh, uh, public services. That's you, Doug. I think you have one item, item that's not on consent. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Navy Mayor and Board, um, <clears throat> before you is a, uh, a wastewater treatment agreement that's proposed from uh, <clears throat> Mr. Perkins. You remember, you may remember from the prior board, the, the one we had with new light utilities yes, for the parcel. Yes, sir. Anyway, um, through legal action, that contract has been dissolved, yes, so sir. we have an opportunity to write a new new contract um, and we've taken the opportunity right. to include in this contract a lot of the language and some that this board has seen you know the one with uh, TESI and the one with um, the link um, essentially with this agreement the, the parcel owner is agreeing to re attach restrictive covenants to the to the parcel um, stating that any new construction or subdivided properties uh, comply with all city codes and ordinances. That way it protects our interest if we, if we annex that parcel at some point in the future. So uh, with that, and then also on the, on the front, I just gave a brief uh, history of the 201 planning area, and, you know, why, we, uh, why you see these agreements from time to time. So, so with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any specific questions you may have in regard to the agreement or um, the interlocal agreement we have uh, for looking at these contracts. Any questions? Ron, you get an opportunity to view the agreement. No, I have, this is the same work we have with the other utilities. Move we'll approved, Mr. Mayor. We have a motion to approve. We have a second. Second. Motion with a second. We approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay.